This is Patrick Russell. I'm interviewing Daniel Hextetter for the first time. This interview is taking place on August the 16th, 2021, and we are in St. Louis, Missouri. This interview is being conducted by the Making History Project. Um, how are you doing today, Daniel? Doing fine. And uh, can you tell me uh, when you were born? I was born May 16th. 1947 in St. Louis, Missouri. All right. And uh, tell me a little bit about what you remember from your childhood in terms of St. Louis. What was it like back then? Well, we, we lived down, well, right now it's a parking lot of Anheuser-Busch Brewery where, where our the home was where I was born in that area. And, and uh, we used to play on the parking lot and then the coal yards would trains would come in from the brewery and I went, went to my grade school was a, a two-room schoolhouse Our Lady of Częstochowa good Polish it was a Polish area in, in that in that area of St. Louis and Sular Kosciuszko area but the the grade school two-room grade school on the first floor the second floor was the, the Catholic Church and at, at funerals, they had to carry caskets up the two flights of steps to get it to the church. It's kind of like a Polish thing, I guess. I don't know, but it's no longer there. It's a freight terminal for trucks now. And how big was your family growing up? Uh, I had an older sister and older brother. And what did your parents do? Well, my, my mother was a housewife, and my, my father was a, a, a brewery worker. Like I said, we lived on a parking lot of, well now it's a parking lot for the brewery, but he'd walk out the alley gate and walk over, walk over to the brewery and he was a beer bottler, making make beer, making make Budweiser. And this is Anheuser-Busch? That's correct. Okay. And um, so you went to high school? Yes. All right. And where did you go? I went to O'Fallon Technical High School, and that was a... The last three years of your high school, once you once you picked your your major, like well, I was architecture drafting, but there was welding and there's aero mechanics and auto mechanics and stenography and even printing back then. It was a printing department, but I was in architecture drafting, and you went to your classes in the morning. Uh, they were all geared towards your major, so you had. Uh, English and history and a lot of mathematics and physics for, for the drafting program. Then in the afternoon you went and spent four hours in the drafting room. And our instructor was a registered professional architect and he treated you like professionals and that's kind of like the reason that, well, your senior year, if, if you were, uh, if your grades were high enough, instead of going to class, he would send you on an OJT program to a to a, a company in, in the St. Louis area, Stuff Brothers Bridge and Iron, or uh, well, I went to Lily Hoffman Cooling Tires, and uh, there's other people went to the electric companies or the different uh, manufacturers in the area as as draftsmen, just brought it, you know as an OJT. What's I, OJT? On on the job training, and uh, then the chief draftsman where I was working. He'd have to grade you to, you know, if you were doing good work or, you know, give you regular grades like, like your drafting instructor would give you. And also take attendance, you know. If you, you didn't show up every day. Well, I showed up because I was making money at the time, you know. So, and that's, when I was drafted then, the Army didn't have to teach me how to be an Army draftsman. I was already, I knew all, all those techniques, so. And yeah. who chose for you to go to that particular school? Uh, well, my, my mother and father originally sent me to a, a, the Catholic high school, Bishop DeBerg, for the first year. And uh, I wanted to learn how to do something. And I said, I, I want to, let me try O'Fallon Tech. And I was doing fine at, at, at Bishop DeBerg, but they said, oh, fine, you can come to this school but you'll have to repeat your freshman year so you can figure out what discipline you want to go into and my mom looked into it and she 
found out that I could go to a vocational counseling all through the summer instead of doing the, the first year over again. And that's what I did. And they, I was thinking I wanted to be a, a graphic artist and draw pictures or something like that. And they said, no, you've got too many mechanical skills to, to waste and your, your artistic ability is not that good. So that's where I, so instead of going to the art department, I went to the, the architectural drafting, which they had architectural and machine drafting, which I didn't want to draw gears apart. So it was, it was a, I would say it was a, a very good education. I'm surprised that there's, there's not any trade schools of that caliber any longer. In high school. In high school. I mean, it, but like the, the reason after, after I was out in even a few years, they kept saying that, well, it's it's too young for a person to make a, a lifelong decision in, in high school of what they want to do. I don't want it worked for me, so I, I can't. I, I I blow that one out of the water. So, and I'm sure there's a lot of other people that stuck with their jobs that they learned, or the trades that they learned at Bill Fallon. And did your high school also have females? Yes. Okay. So it was a mixture. And when did you graduate? In uh, 1965. All right. And while you were going to high school, did you have any hobbies or play any sports? Uh, I, I played a little uh, intramural baseball and, and, and softball and things like that. But uh, it was kind of weird I, when when I was in grade school, I tried to get, um, well, when you get up to cert certain level, like fourth or fifth grade, you have to go get a, a physical exam. And our family doctor wouldn't let me play because I had rheumatic fever as a, as a child, a, a two-year-old, rheumatic fever and a, a heart murmur or something like that. Oh, you can't play. <laughs> that same doctor, I went back to him when I had my show up for the draft, the events of that thing was, was uneventful. Here's your ticket. <laughs> oh. Same guy. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> so the doctor at the VA recently said, you had rheumatic fever and they let you in the army? They were taking everybody in, in Vietnam era. Mm -hmm. There wasn't many got around it. So after high school, what did you do? Well, like I said, I already, I already had the job with, with Lily Hoffman Cooling Towers. So I just went full time with them and stayed, stayed drawn until they drafted me. And, and then when was that? In 1966, in September of 66. So I had from, say, late May, June of, of 65 when I graduated, about a year and a half, and then I was in the Army. All right. And, um,. You were drafted, and how did you feel about getting that draft notice? Uh, you well, know, it was it was scary, and you know everybody knew that what was going on in, in Southeast Asia. It was like, oh boy, you're gonna end up there. But there was so many people getting drafted at that time. My my basic training. Well, we have a, a big basic training center in in Missouri at Fort Leonard Wood, in mid Missouri, and I thought, well, everybody goes there. They shipped us out, up to, took a bunch of us and said, you're going to Fort Ord, California for basic, because they were so full at Fort Lunderwood. Okay, so we go out there. And I thought, okay, <laughs> what, what's this all about? Then after that, you know, six weeks at basic, and they sent me with orders to Fort Benning, Georgia. And then, and that was a, a waiting game there. Everybody, when they're giving you, when you're graduating from basic, they're going down the line, they're calling the list of names, 11B, 11B, 11, and that's riflemen, you know, basic riflemen. That's what they do to hold a gun and shoot people. And they got to me and this other friend of mine that I went to high school with. They came up with some silly number, and the, fort, the, the sergeant giving out those orders. I don't know what what that order is for. He says, "See me in the yardly room later. I'll, I'll I'll look it up in the book." So after the everybody goes their separate ways after that formation was done, we walk in there and uh, I said, well, we're here. But what's this order? What do you want to know? I says, "This 
MOS is military occupation specialty. I never seen that. You're, well, you're not a cook. I know it's not a cook. You're not a uh, artillery guy. You're not a, uh, a ground pounder. Pulls out a book, and there's a bunch of other people in the yard of the room. Goes, well, looky here. We got ourselves two generals. General Grassman. <laughs> that was his joke of the day. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So what do we do? OJT Fort Benning. So we went to Fort Benning. We'll do a maintenance company down there. And you think they gave you that MOS because of your high school background specifically? Oh, definitely. Yeah, because there was other guys that I graduated from high school with that were in the same bunch of draftees. They, they might have worked. One guy worked at a cook at a, a good restaurant. He got to be a, a cook, you know, OJT cook. Another one just worked at like a McDonald's or a Burger King. He was a cook. So if, if you had any experience in any of those things, if the Army could get you in the field as fast as possible back then. It was, you know, everyone didn't, didn't go to, uh, through formal Army, Army training. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that speeded up the process of getting you on, on the road to being a, a regular troop. And how did your family feel about you going to Vietnam? Oh, no, my, my mom did not. You're not going. <laughs> you, you can't go. But it, it was strange because I, I went, to, you know, everybody was going to Vietnam for a year. So I, I thought I was safe. You know, I really thought, man, I get the year in, I'll, I'll order a new car, brand new car, find 68 GTO. <laughs> I had it on order, and uh, I had, they moved me from the maintenance company in, in Florida, or in Georgia, down to Eglin Air Force Base in uh, Northwest Florida. And, uh, and that was a, it's an Air Force base and not in the middle of it is this Auxiliary Field 7 where they trained the Army Rangers, which there some tough guys there. And I was cadre there, just, there was a, the old World War II uh, control tower. That was the drafting room. So I got to look out over all of the, the, the airfield which they, didn't use much, it was just, you know, used for if the helicopters came in or something like that. But I was already past my year, so I thought, September's here, I'm good, I'm good, I'm going, I ain't going to Vietnam. And then I got my orders, you're going. Why would I go less, so I went from, from January of 68 to September, and then I got out. So I was only over there in nine months, which was, very rare. And, you know, when, when I got those orders, I said, why would you send me for nine months? Well, it's a critical MOS, critical military specialty. Okay, I didn't know they needed it that bad, but... So that's how that, how that went. And um, how was basic training for you? Well, it was tough. I mean, you, you, you just, you know, they, back then, I mean, the, the, the language that's used and they just try to beat you down in every way possible to do what they want to get done and get it done the army way. You know, there's a bunch of ways of doing it, but this is the way you're supposed to do it. So they really they treat you very bad. I mean, they, but back then I don't know how it's done. They're probably a whole lot better, but uh, you you just got to do it. You know, if you if you don't, I mean, we had one one guy that just couldn't take it. He mentally, you know, he buzzed out, he couldn't handle it, they let him, had him go home. But I mean, even even to the point where the one guy, he, he got a, a disability discharge because he, he had a birth defect and he couldn't salute. His hands were, something wrong with his hands. And the sergeants would grab his hands and bend them and, oh, okay, can you salute me? <laughs> I go like that. And I felt sorry for the poor guy, but he finally got out. Because he couldn't there, salute. Because he couldn't salute, he would, well, and it was another thing, he, he had a problem, you know, holding a rifle. You know, because I don't think he, he could use it, I don't think the one finger would even work. He, you know, why, why he ever got past the original inspections, I never know, but... Because they do give you physicals going in. But it, uh, once you get past basic, they, they start, you know, you, they, you're treated pretty well. I mean, it wasn't, I can't really complain to say that anybody really 
gave you, you know, tried to give you a hard time, unless, unless you were, unless you wanted to make trouble for yourself. And so basic was in California. Right. How long? About six weeks. I think six, seven weeks with the zero week, you know, with all the shots and all of that. And then from there, you have advanced training. Never went to advanced training. I was on a job training in Fort Benning. Okay. And. And I walked in there, and they, the walked into the main orderly room, and they said, "Oh, you're the draftsman. Here's the keys for your office." Go down the hall, open it up, and biggest thing I did there with on any frequency was little name tags for the officers. Uh, Captain Joe and his wife Laureen, you know, for for officers' parties. He did a lot of that at, at Fort Benning. But that, that unit had just got back from a deployment in uh, the Dominican Republic. They, it was a, they were a maintenance battalion that maintained heavy equipment. And that, that was kind of uh, the worst barracks I ever stayed in. It was these great big uh, brick castle-like, and it was just like an echo chamber. If someone touched the locker, Two blocks away, everything rattled through there. It was kind of kind of miserable. Not quite as miserable as Vietnam, but what was it like to be at Fort Benning? I, I, is it the airborne training there? That's airborne training, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, well, this was a maintenance company, so they, the jump towers, you know, we could watch them do that thing. But I'm smart enough not to get involved with jumping out of a plane. <laughs> All right, you didn't really interact too much with them. No, we, I didn't, well, we didn't, it was nothing to do with airborne, so. And what were you, if you were on the job training in Fort Benning, what were you doing? Well, like I said, the uh, charts and graphs, uh, a, lot of, a lot of signage, you know, uh, for, for the different offices, because they, like I said, they just got back in from deployment, so, there were, you know, like little name tags on, on doors and things like that. And, and signs like this way to mess hall or whatever, you know, signage, uh, a lot of spray painting and uh, just little, little sign, big signs or, you know, whatever, whatever someone up and down the whole, whatever, uh, if, they were, if they needed a sign, they'd come to the drafting room and say, can you make this? Yeah. When do you want it? Uh, now, okay, I'll get it to you tomorrow, whatever. But I was pretty much my, my own boss because it was, you know, but I mean, you still had to do the, the KPs and things like that. I mean, you had to just do exactly what they were told, you know, and don't get too far from that. I mean, there's some silly stories even out in, in, in California. They'd have had KP to one day and they had these milk machines, two, two chalk, they're two white and a chocolate. And there was three of these big machines, and at every meal, the I don't know what these big boxes of milk were, the plastic cardboard box with a plastic lid inside, and you took them out on the loading dock after the meals and cut them open and drain them into the sewer. So the next day, Private Dan Hexteder thought, well, I'm going to get an extra glass of milk. So I walk up there, get an extra. I'm coming back, and the sergeant goes. Where'd you get that? From well, the machine. Well, didn't you get one when you went through the line? Yep. Well, who told you that you could have another milk? I went, well, I just figured it since I was on KP yesterday and we were throwing all that milk away, I could maybe have another glass of milk. Oh, good deal. Well, since you like KP so good, you got it again tomorrow. I mean, that's the, the kind of the things they'll, they'll do to just show you you better do exactly what you're told exactly what you told them. Not, don't think for yourself. That was, that was kind of a good, that was my basic training. Good story. And um, your drafting room, how many people are you working with? Well, in, in Benning I was by myself and in uh, uh, England Air Force Base at the Rancher Camp there was another draftsman. There was two of us there. And then in Vietnam there was just me. And uh, you're still pulling, you say, KP besides doing that? Oh, yeah, but, but in, the, in, in Florida, at the ranger camp, we always had a support company, uh, a transport company come down 
to do all of our other chores while while the, the, the students were in there was like a, a student cycle so every month was another cycle so these the rangers would come down from Fort Benning <clears throat> and it was a kind of guerrilla phase and they acted like uh, there was a bunch out of Cuba that came in and they ambushed the bus that they were riding in on. They'd, they'd get them started right away and they were in a combat situation that the, the, the students were. But So that meant that the support company that were the aggressors against the students, they would also pull all of our duties like KP and hauling trash and mowing grass and all of that. So we didn't do anything except on cycle break, there was like a small party, the permanent party was like maybe 17 people on, on, on the camp there, you know, because the officers, the, the training guys would maybe go back to Fort Benning. But we just, it was like a vacation, you know, we, we, well, who's going to do KP tomorrow? You, you wash the dishes, you haul the stuff out, it was that kind of deal. It was very, very relaxed on circle, cycle break. It was kind of neat. But then once they got back, once the next training unit came in, then we went back to our regular jobs again. It was, it was kind of, it was neat. And then we had, I had a, a motorcycle, so I'd get on my motorcycle and go to Fort Walton Beach and go down there on the weekends and, you know, it was about 40 miles to main base off of, <laughs> from Auxiliary Field 7, that's how big Eglin is. Hmm. It's tremendous in size. And um, so you did eventually deploy overseas, right? Yes. And what month was that? In, in January of 68. Uh, okay. And, and that was through, uh, through Oakland, Oakland, California, and then over to Vietnam from there. And uh, where did you actually end up in Vietnam? Where did you land? Well, I landed in Saigon at, at Tansanu, and then uh, to 90th replacement, which was just right in the Saigon area. And then it's two or three days before you get your orders, and you know, you're just trying to figure out where they can send you. And uh, then the orders came down, and it was like, You're going up country. I said, well, How far? They said, Up country. So it, I think we got on a, a C 130 to, I guess. Might have been Da Nang or maybe uh, Chu Lai or someplace like halfway up. And then we got on a smaller plane. And then when we got to An K, then you spend, spend a week in, that was the, the first camp's uh, main base camp was An K, which is Central Highlands right in the middle of Vietnam. And uh, spend a week there in charm school. Everybody, whether you're a cook or a draftsman or whatever, you do a, a field maneuver. It's very controlled. I mean, it, they don't send you out on a look for a mission, you know, not a search and destroy mission, but it was pretty intense. And you're just on the ground for a week in Vietnam. And we got to watch them blow up uh, aircraft sitting on the runway. We were on, high up on a mountain and they were getting attacked down there. And we were watching airplanes blow up down there. This is real. <laughs> we spent a, spent a week there, and then I think from there I get I got to ride a a, a caribou, another a little smaller aircraft to uh, way Fu by, and then from there uh, a Huey up to the to the field to to Camp Evans. And where was Camp Evans located? Uh, north of Way, uh, south of the DMZ, about halfway between there. And the the town was uh, Phong Dien which we'd go there, to, we had to get our, our water from the, the creek that was up there, a little, little stream, and get the jeeps washed there. We, that, was our, that was the only time I got outside the perimeter, was, was to make a, a, a water run or to get the jeep washed, or just, really just a play to get out of where we were. And there was really no, no reason for me to ever go to any town or get off the base, because it was just a nasty area. I mean, you know, I didn't need to go to town for no reason. And they, and they wouldn't, I mean, nighttime fell and the gates were closed and there was no action in or out like that. How big was the base? Um, when I got there, it was, it was a Marine base and the Army had 
encircle the Marines, to go, the tale is the camp guys say, to protect the Marines from themselves. <laughs> That's an Army Marine joke, but it was pretty good size. Uh, the, the type of aircraft that they would bring in there to the airstrip were, were small, just two engine caribou's at the time. But uh, they were extending the runway to make it bigger, and uh, everything was just helicopters. I mean, the, the, the drone and helicopters was 24/7. I mean, just just outside my my hooch, you know, like from here to across the street was just a, a line of helicopters, either uh, UH ones, you know, Hueys or, or observation the little loaches and that. And everything we did was on a helicopter with the first air cam. And they used, I mean, they, they utilized those helicopters. I mean, it was amazing. And, and all of our helicopter pilots, it, it was, it, it's kind of sad to see these guys that were really trained and, and very good pilots, you know, were hoping for, to come back to the, to the States and have a job, you know, as an air ambulance or air taxi and things like that. But it never really materialized for them because it was, it was so, uh, the insurance and the, you know, the amount of money it, it cost to operate a helicopter just was so just tremendous. It, it just escalated like crazy. But I mean, boy, it was a lot of helicopters there. Do you know what units those helicopters belonged to? Right, they were. They were. Right, right, we had uh, the first cav. The the first squadron, the ninth cavalry of the first cavalry division, was what they called the eyes and the ears of the first air cav. So it was. Our unit, we had headquarters troop, which I was in, which, well, just headquarters, you know, really answers to them. Then they had A, B, and C troops were helicopter units, uh, and then the D troop was the road reconnaissance. And they had the jeeps with the machine guns on the back, and they would patrol the road and kept the road clear. And But the, the other three, uh, A troop, B troop, and C troop, where each one of those had three sections. It had the, the whites, which were the uh, reconnaissance, and the reds, which were the area rocket artillery, you know, that would, well, exactly what it was. It, uh, the one to two inch rockets on both sides that you know, hit the enemy like that. And then the blues were the, uh, the ground pounders, you know, the, the infantry men. And it was, the first squadron, ninth cavalry's duty to find and fix the enemy, to go out and pick a fight someplace, and then the fifth to the seventh, or you know, the, the big units could come in there for the, the big battles, and that, that's what they did. They were just kind of like to go go find someplace to, to to get a good fight going. Where they needed more bigger equipment, and you know, they haul artillery units in and on helicopters. That's that's what what they did. And they, they could find some good ones too. And then uh, the Ashaw Valley was just to our west. And that's where a lot of our fighting was done. And they were, I kept my fingers crossed because they kept saying, we're going to put a jump CP, a jump command post out in the Ashaw Valley. I'm thinking, mm, boy, I got this 4 by 8 sheet of plywood that's a drafting table. I, I ain't going. <laughs> They go, no, we don't think you're going to have to go. Oh, good. Because when we fly over, we landed one time in the Ashaw just because anytime we were going, like if I needed maps down the way, I, if I could get a helicopter, it was just somebody going away, and they'd say, yeah, let's. So I'd go down there and pick up the maps for the, for the pilots and have a good supply of them. If we'd run out, you had to have maps, you'd, I'd have to acquire them, or either ride down there. One time we actually drove a Jeep and we said, I, said, I need maps. And I'm talking to the guys, you know, the, the aircraft guys. Can we get a helicopter? Not today, we're all busy. Take a Jeep. We're going to get on the road and drive down the way? Yeah, the road's open. Okay. And, but I mean, I don't know why they didn't use this in Afghanistan, but when they said the road was open, a gun Jeep was here and if there was a a road that had a turn in it, there'd be another gun jeep looking both ways at that corner of the road. And if somebody walked out there to plant a bomb, it'd shoot them. 
I mean, that's what do, that was her job, to keep the road clear. And I'm sure, well, we had some Jeeps blow up, you know, just got out there before the, the road was cleared, but it, it was, it was raw. <laughs> but we, we got the, I got the drive through the Citadel that way, that was way after Tet, that was like in the summer then, but held at the flagpole at, at, in way during that offensive, that, that January. That they said the flag was, flagpole was worn out and went up and down with the North Vietnamese flag, you know, because they'd take it and then they'd, you know, the Citadel, the Citadel would go back and forth like that through the, through the battle over the, about two, three weeks like that. It was bad. You said the neighborhood surrounding the base was bad. How so? Well, it's just, it just really just like wooden, wooden little businesses and shacks. We, the, the main street was just, you know, they might have a little display of, of soda on the on display or something like that. It was it was a very very small small community, and you know the the one time driving to the uh, to get water, me and another guy in the jeep, and they had like a iron fence, and there was uh, three three heads stuck on the top of the iron fence, and the bodies laid out in front of them that the Viet Cong went and there. Probably the NVA, I would imagine it, you know, because we were so far north. Our enemy was mostly the NVA, but they had executed three three of the people and just laid them out there, you know, so the other villagers could see it. It, it, it did some silly stuff, and we would. Our our my biggest threat personally was was the rockets and the martyrs, and if. Uh, like I say, when I first got there, it was like, jump off the helicopter, throw your duffel bag off, and, oh, we're glad you're here. You better dig a hole. I said, okay, where? Well, just, hey, yeah, you're here. This is our, our troops here. So I'm digging around, and your helicopter flies by right over our head and starts shooting at people out in the, in the field there. I'm going, I guess I better dig a hole. <laughs> I dug my hole, but then finally, when we, when the whole thing started to settle in, then we had a, a, a guy passing by with a, a backhoe, and me and my, the guy that was in my, uh, my bunker with me, because we we had made some bunkers out of rocket boxes, you know, just fill them with sand and nice little cute little cubicle for you to sleep in, and. It, and if the rocket would hit out there, you're hoping that the shrapnel wouldn't get you, you know. But then we finally went completely underground because it was getting really bad, you know, toward you know, right in the middle of the tent. So we dug a big hole, and then we had a guy in a helicopter, <coughs> had this runway matting. He landed right outside of our hole in the ground, and we scoot, slid it all off the skids, and then laid on top of this metal as he pulled pitch and got out of there, metal shaking. I hope we're not flying. Mm. So then we put that over it, and then about three layers of sandbags, and then uh, artillery casings, which are brass metal, so thinking that the rocket would hit that and maybe explode there before it got all the way into the, into the bunker. But that was never tested, thank the Lord. So you made your own bunker underground? Right. Made our own bunker, made our own <clears throat> shower. <laughs> no, we, there was there was no services. And How long did you? So for the full nine months, you lived in that bunker. No, about the last about the last month, the the CBs came and made uh, tent frames for us, and which is just a wooden frame. And those CBs are hard workers, man. I. If you wanted to build a house, these guys could build a house in a day. I mean, it's just everything. Fine oil machine, they put the floor down, and one guy was with a, a dumpy level transit, was calling out the numbers, and they'd mark it. They'd throw the, the little sharp, stubby columns, you know, to make the floor level, throw it back to one guy, he'd cut it, nail it in, and then we had to cover it up with a, a GP medium tent, you know, a big, a big tent. And then we had our own little places in there. You could 
but we, we didn't want to move into those until they dug us a whole lot close where we could run to them when, when incoming was. And we got incoming every day. If it wasn't two mortars, it'd be two or three rockets. And if nothing happened that day, you can be real sure that they'd save it up for the next day and then you'd get six or eight of them. And they'd hit just randomly all over the camp. But they had randomly, but they, they weren't, they were pretty good shots. Because like about the week before Ho Chi Minh's birthday, at 12 noon on the dot, one rocket would come in. <laughs> and then the next day, 12 noon, 12 noon. Ho Chi Minh's birthday, he came in and he hit the ammo dump. And the ammo dump, for first air cab, is a lot of ammo, and it's just exploding and everything going up. And so I was able to crawl into the, the TAC, which was the op Tactical Operations Center, which was a pretty good sized building underground. So that's where we weathered that, that night. And there was, uh, I think there was 40s, these big blivets of gasoline. Real smart, next to the ammo dump. And when they blew up, I mean, this, it was like an earthquake, just the building just moved like that. And we had fluorescent lights where they all burst and the, the dirt dust coming. Kind of like, we had a big timber frame building with that metal plating on, on top. And that's where all the radios for the you know, whole unit would run out of this operation center. And I always remember one sergeant, he goes, that was one, there's three more. And he was right, three more blew up. Boy, I mean, it, 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 was, it was nasty. But that's one of, our, one of our pilots that came in on the other side of, the, of a little hill. And this explosion from those fuel of us blowing up was so intense that it, it would shake the, the generator, big 45 kW generator, so bad that it would lose lose compression or it would knock the air out of the thing. So it would stall so we had no lights. So this this one uh, one guy in our unit that, that took care of that, he he ran out and he'd start his start this little small little generator like like he could get from Home Depot. It's a little tiny thing. But it was enough to keep our lights and the radios going. And about the second time he went out there it was a pilot's out of a, a Cobra helicopter that had crawled in and they were in his little generator pit. So he grabbed a boat. You're coming with me. You're going back to the operation center. So, <laughs> and when he gets back, I mean, the guy was, if it had gasoline in it, he could make it run. And that's the way we got all these little generators that somebody else was throwing on the way because they couldn't make it run. This guy, Billy Farmer, could. And these pilots said, Billy, all that stuff exploding, you, you're going to get hurt. He said, you don't understand. That's our ammo dump blowing up. We're going, Billy, it's still stuff flying through the air. It's going to knock you. No, that's our stuff. So he, he got a, a brown star with, with, with V-Device for bringing those. Because those two pilots would have stayed in that out in the open, in, a, in an open pit all night long. I mean, and it was pretty much into the, the next day, I'd say probably 2, 3 o'clock before. It wasn't all clear, it was still popping off but and still smoking over there, but it, it had us down. And the, it was, the explosions were so intense that the, the tail booms on the helicopters that were, like if the ammo dump was there, the tail booms were bent from the concussion. That's a, that's a pretty good explosion. And that's even inside these Sandbag revetment, just the back end was hanging out enough with a concussion to catch that, that tail boom. Was your base ever attacked like physically? Yeah, we'd have, uh, I use a nice, we had an enemy in the, in the wire every now and then. And we'd take a different uh, attack, but I mean, we had, you know, our gear was every day flak vest and M16 on. on on all of us, all of our side, we, we had a we had to be armed all the time, and it was, uh, and you never knew because well, when we first got there, it was just 
our base had three rows of concertina wire around the thing. That was all we had no uh, no real well there's never any walls or anything, but no uh, no bunkers or any guard towers put up. But then, you know, within a month or so then they they got those in place with you know, we I pulled guard duty out there and you take your hour turn and then go to, go to sleep or sit around and then somebody else to turn to watch and it was always, you know, there was always some probes. I mean, it, it was, the, you know, they, I think it was just a harassment thing on their part, you know, because the small group of people that would take, I don't know what they would try to accomplish with the amount of people that were even on this, this small, well, it wasn't a small base, but it would take a, a, you know, a lot of people, but now when you start reading and, and finding out how big the NVA army coming down, you know, well, they could have overrun us any time they would have wanted to, but they had no reason to, because I, I guess, I don't know. But they, they, they attacked us close enough, I mean, it was some, some nasty stuff that I've seen, it's just, just bad, I mean, you just, can't imagine what a what a rocket will do. I mean, it's and you know, and then the uh, the flight surgeon, you know, the, the the medic place was over like a, across a little valley from us, and uh, you'd see you know the, the body bag stacked up there, and, and the best information they would go, they'd say, just don't look there. Don't look there. You shouldn't. Yet that will affect you. Yeah. Don't look there. But we had uh, the body bags were for what? For the guys going on the missions and coming back on the no, helicopters. Com coming back dead. Coming back. They went out. And they came back. They came back in a body bag. And they bring them. They put two or three. We, we, you know, since they were the scouts, they didn't. We didn't have a lot of that. But there, we had a lot of KIAs. And then the, the one very close to us after a rocket attack, we had, uh, it was like early evening and there was, you know, because you didn't stay in your hooch all the time, you're underground. There was three guys in a, in a, in a tent, a GP medium, that came in and they were dead instantly. And, uh, you know, and that time, the, what do they call it, the, the intelligence officer at the top of the hill, he he had he got hit at the same time. I we, we our little hooch was underground here and at the right top of this little rise, that's where the, the intelligence officer was and right across from him was where that where those three guys got killed. But this guy, he had a, a, a shoulder wound and his tent was blown away or his hooch was blown away. And he had a like they tell you about a sucking chest wound, we had a sucking shoulder wound. It was, it was like breathing, and I'm, I'm standing looking at, at you know, because we were operations when we went to the motor pool, you know, after a, a rocket attack. We'd go to the motor pool, the motor pool would go to aircraft maintenance, the aircraft maintenance would go to communal, you know, so in other words, if your area was hit, you'd have nobody to help you, so that, you, you switched, and it was all crazy. So, we had to go to the motor pool, and I was, running across this thing. I see this guy laying and I'm like, oh God. And the sergeant actually came and kicked me up. I just literally kicked me. He asked, you don't belong here, troop. Go where you're supposed to go. So we went there and then me and my buddy Joe, we hauled a guy that got uh, some shrapnel in the back of his leg and that. And it, was, it was pretty bad. But we, buddy carried him back to the flight surgeon's place. And it's just something you don't want to use. You see that? It's the geez. That was kind of a bummer. But, you know, I made it. That's the good part. Well, a lot of guys didn't. Yeah. What was the terrain for your base like? We were, I would say, like rolling hills, but to the to the west of us was the the mountains, and beyond those, or right in those mountains, was the Ashaw Valley. But to the east of us, was uh, the the about I'd say maybe four or six miles out to the coast in a nice beach and everything there. Well, they would this is kind of a term, but when you 
you know, the old term to go commando over there, you know, well, when you, you get uh, like a crotch rod or, you know, bad, bad enough that, you know, what are you going to do? Well, the flight surgeon would say, he'd list you and you take a ride in the helicopter, take you out to the, to the sea, to South China Sea, and you spend, well, the first couple batches would spend the whole day there. Well, they come in sunburned like you wouldn't believe, so then they start doing half a day's. So I did that a couple times. You, you'd swim in that salt water, it would, you know, it'd make you well pretty quick. It, it's really therapeutic. It was great. But uh, any place you set, you know, like, there'd be like six guys off of Huey, and you, you put a, a, a blanket or, or not a blanket, you put a towel on, you didn't have no beach towels or nothing, and a, 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 like a cooler, an army cooler with some water in it. So you'd be there, and then these, these Navy, People were unloading uh, bigger ships off off there, and they'd come in with these the, the li little delivery boats that were amphibious, I guess. And they'd aim for wherever you were set up. <laughs> All right, here they come again. So you'd move your stuff, and they'd go up the beach, and they'd come back down, and you'd see them out there. You want to say, hey, guys, go there, go there. Nope, they have to, they'd aim at you. And that was their way, that was their fun that day, I guess. Hmm. But that, you got to do something to maintain yourself. And what weapons were you trained on, even though you were a draftsman? I was I was trained originally in, in basic was an M14, you know, big old fashioned M14. And then before I went to Vietnam, I had to go to the Air Force training with the M16. And that was that was our that was our everybody had an M16. And then when I I got, I had to keep my M16, but I got a, a, a 45 side you know, pistol. Because one guy went, went home and uh, he had one of these Pancho Villa pistol belts where you put all the bullets around the back. Man, I thought this is great. So I went this, and they said, so yeah, you can get a, a side arm. Ooh, I thought it was cool. But then I was on charge of quarters one time and I was cleaning the thing and I shot a hole in the, in the desk. <laughs> You know, in the in this operation center, there's about three other radio operators in there. They're going, oh, "You didn't shoot me." As well. But uh, no, we had that, and it, that was my biggest thing about guns and weapons control right now is that any anybody that never seen a M16 can go and buy a semi-automatic weapon have no training and have no uh, respect for that weapon, they can survive. And all of the guys in Vietnam, the, the magazine, the standard issue magazine, held 20 rounds, but all of the, the army propaganda and all of the information they give you, and they tell you this every day on the radios, and load 18, because the, the early M16s would the, the magazines were so strong they tried to load two rounds at the same time. They would jam. The first two would try to jam. And when the guys were out in the field, the first shots they do, they jam right there. So they say load, load 18. So combat troops in Vietnam had 18 rounds. Now these people can go to a sporting goods store or Dick's or Cabela's and buy 80, 100 round magazines for that same weapon. It's wrong. You don't need that. No reason in the world. And, it, and the other thing about that, they have no respect and no training. That's just my opinion, but <laughs> they took my M16 away when I left Vietnam. I never needed one since. Did you ever have to use it? No, never did. I played with it. I mean, we played, you know, every, every chance we got, we'd go out to the uh, perimeter and you could shoot. There was like a little cemetery out there. We'd shoot at the tops of the headstones. And, Whatever it, I don't even know what they were, some kind of monuments, but we could we could do that, and they wanted you to be proficient, you know. But uh, that was just, and I, I I thank the Lord I never had to use it, and that's why so many times even people say I'll shoot them, I'll shoot them. Well, I've seen many of our our, our blue troops, you know, the, the the infantry troops come back in after they got their first kill. And they were not the same. They were they, they were effective. 
they were definitely affected. Because when you see somebody right across from you and you shoot them dead, that's something. I mean, I've seen it firsthand. What was your highest rank? I, I was a specialist E5, which is pretty good. Usually in, in two years, if you, if you don't go to Vietnam, you probably E4 would be the best you could expect to accomplish. So E5 was, I thought was pretty good. I think that probably still stands today. And tell me a little bit about what you were doing in Vietnam then. Well, I did... Uh, on that base? Uh, on that base, just, uh, well, my, my biggest thing is to keep all of the helicopter pilots in maps so that, you know, when they would go out flying, because, you know, they'd wrinkle them up and take the area that they were using, and the maps pretty much tore up after a couple missions. So I'd make sure that all the maps were, were up to date and, you know, the, the latest that were available, and, you know, the, the map sections. And then I knew they were going into the Ashaw because they start requesting the next sheet over, the next sheet over, said, hey, I think we're going to the Ashaw. So, so I kind of had a pretty good heads up on that. And uh, the other thing, I'd have to mark the, the no-fly zones on the, on the big map so that the helicopters weren't flying when there was a, a large artillery uh, barrage coming in. Because the, the battleships off in the, out on the ocean were, were shooting across us, you know, right over our heads in, into the Yashaw Valley there. And it, it's the best way to describe it, it sounded like a Volkswagen flying through the air and just <laughs> something would be flopping artillery's over here. I mean it's crazy. There must be some well sixteen inch shells. But that and then uh, the signage, you know, with you know command post, first squadron, ninth cavalry, you know, sign for that and the arrows to point to these different things and and my best, uh, my best thing was the uh, aircraft maintenance officer came in. He asked me. Came in a little. Our tent was. We had the uh, the safety officer and the flight records clerk and uh, there's another one. There's there's four of us in that tent. That our jobs and the draft. I was down the bottom of the list. So this, the aircraft maintenance officer comes in. He says. I got a piece of plywood over at aircraft maintenance and I want you to come and, and let her all, you know, with the Leroy lettering set, which is, you know, real fancy, nice, super good look looking lettering. I want you to letter on this plywood, all the aircraft tail numbers and then the, if they're no fly or, you know, what's wrong with them, what needs to be fixed or whatever like that. I said, okay, so we'll bring the plywood over here to the tent here. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Well, well no, you know, I want you to come over there. So I kind of put them off for a couple of weeks. So my uh, uh, my safety officer, he, he was a pilot. He's he's sitting in there this one day. This this officer comes back in. He goes, "Okay, Hex, you gonna come over and paint that that aircraft status for me?" I said, "What the? Do I look like a doctor? I don't make house calls." He didn't like that. So this is in a combat zone. He locked my ears like troop. <laughs> so I had a snap to attention, <laughs> and my officer sitting in the car here, he's busting a gut laughing. He goes, oh man, he goes, you really did. I said, what are we, he's a, he's a captain, he told me to attention, so I snapped to attention. He goes, that's what he wants you to do, you know. I said, yeah, I know that. So I had to haul all my stuff across the aircraft maintenance and painted the sign farm in his, his aircraft place, which was well, just as dusty and dirty as where I was working, so it didn't make much difference. And the maps, did you have to modify the maps anyway, or...? Well, the maps all came from St. Louis here, from the charge plant down on, uh, on Arsenal Street, right here in St. Louis. But, I mean, the maps were as good as you could get back then, but the, the biggest thing are... Uh, we had a briefing tent, and this is before I even got there, they had that set up. It was probably 20 foot wide and maybe 10, 15 foot high and it was all these maps all pasted together of the whole from DMZ and uh, Quezon and all the way down to Way and they had it covered in, in, in plexiglass, plexiglass panels and then they had 
of fluorescent lights around the outside of it. And at briefing time, right at, right at dusk, they took, and all of the grease pencil, all the marks on that map were just beautiful. I mean, just really neat looking, you know. But I, I, I would mark, you know, MDA, the maximum density altitude, and some of the information I put on there, but most of the time the officers would, you know, put all of their areas where they were going into, you know, and enemy locations and where other uh, units were moving through and that. So they handled it on their own. Oh yeah, they well they they had to because I think a lot of it the in, intelligence officer would you know the, the S two would that was their part of the deal you know they that was all top secret stuff and back then I mean there was no cell phones there was you know no communication outside of that but they, they still would was was very uh, they they played war to the you know they, they were really doing a good job of playing war you know they, they knew knew how to do that kind of stuff. But one of our, one of my crazy things with the with the S two, S three is operations, which I was, and one day I knew because we're posting maps and that that there was going to be arc light, you know, a big B fifty two run, right, on our our side of the mountains, you know, up there, and an arc light just it's when the bombers, a line of B fifty twos just, they don't aim, they just open the the doors of the bomb bay door and it all drops in one spot and it just rumbles for 20 minutes. I mean, it's blown up. So I knew that it was going to happen the next day. And here, at, at the evening, it's it's snowing. I mean, it's just leafless coming out of the sky. What's this? So I look at it, and it's a picture of a B-52 dropping the bombs. And then on the back side is a bunch of Vietnamese riding. So I take it to the S-3, the operations officer. I said, what's this? He said, oh, that's, you, you go, go talk to the S-2, the, the intelligence officer. He'll, he'll, he'll fill you in on that. Okay. I catch the other guys. Hey, Captain, what's this? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a psychological operation. Okay, well, what, what's, what, what does this say? Well, it's, it's saying that tomorrow at, at 1,200 hours that there's going to be a, a big bombing run in, in this area over there. I said, well, you're, you're telling the enemy you're going to bomb there? Well, it's not meant for the enemy. It's meant for the good people in that area, the farmers and stuff, so they can get out of that area. Okay. <laughs> And he, you know, I mean, he didn't crack a smile. He was just like, "Boy, oh, it's only for the the good guys to get out of that area." And it's like snow, and everybody knew that they were going to bomb there the next day. That's the way it went, you know. Mm -hmm. That sometimes is sometimes is the absurdity of war. Yeah, it it was just, you know, and it it you you think back, you think, what and like my wife, I said, what was the things that affected you? Or the things you can remember, and it's the 24/7 of the helicopter noise, all the time. And the other thing was the the heaviness of the air. I mean, it was just when we were years ago, we went to a, to one part of Disney at Discovery Island, and it it brought some crazy memories back to me. It's just a real tight tightness of the jungle air and. And even though we were really not in a jungle where we were, we were high plains, but it was still that heavy air and the moisture. And, and when, when Jenny would send us back a package from Japan and you'd open it up, it had say musty, musty smell. That's your daughter. Yeah, when would she send us back a, even, you know, even an envelope with some maps or little Disney brochures. I remember that smell, but really? uh, the the other the living you know living in a hole in the ground has its you know we finally had a artillery parachute a white parachute that we put over the mud walls so you wouldn't be looking at the little things crawling around and the mushrooms growing that's why I still won't eat mushrooms uh, seen enough mushrooms <laughs> it's it's there's some crazy things that just stick with you but. Did you ever interact with any of the uh, local civilians? No, I did not. Well, we had we had a, a Vietnamese barber that would come in and, and, and cut hair, but we we 
where we were, there was no need and no reason to be out there. It, this was, like I say, very, very far north. We were just, and I, I was very happy to stay safe. And, uh, I was not very adventurous. And did you ever get injured? No, uh, not not injured, but I'm injured with with my uh, my burn, and they 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 treated me. I mean, they, you know, the, the medics there, the the flight surgeon would. I had to go there every day. But they said that night they said we'll we'll assess you in the morning, bandage you up, and clean the wound and all of that. We'll assess you in the morning whether you gotta leave the base, leave leave the camp here. And I was thinking, you know, because I've seen other people leave with injuries and their stuff just. You know, you, you never find your stuff again, which I guess that means little to nothing when you're really hurt, but I wasn't. I was still ambulatory. I could move around. It was just bandaged up, but I'd have to go get my bandage changed every day. And once a week I had to see the, the flight surgeon, and he would rip it off. He just, the captain would just take it off. Where, where the, the medics were very gentle, and they, but I was the banana man for a while because all, all of this ointment that they put on me, was some yellow stuff. I don't know what it was, but it smelled like bananas. And then by 10 o'clock in the morning, you'd be sweating and it would be dripping out of the bandage, you know. And a banana man's here again. And it just smelled like a bunch of squished bananas. But no scars or anything. For this a while, from your shower explosion. Yeah. That you were telling me about. Homemade shower. <laughs> uh, we were lucky to get that. I mean, they, they had no facilities. I mean, the, the sanitary facilities, well, you probably heard the, the, sh the ship burning stories and I mean that's that's the way it was man it, it was very very primitive on that base what was your most memorable moment most memorable well probably the, the my, my going home party and everybody always had going home parties you know when, when you were getting out but uh it was pretty good. I was, because you'd have to save up, you know, you'd always want to have a good party. So we had, you know, we went the, the way and I had a little refrigerator that me and a couple other guys went in on. So we were saving beers up. So we saved up, uh, I think I had like 10 cases, because there's a lot of guys in, in the unit, had like 10 cases of combination of Schlitz or Blatz or Carling or whatever kind of beers. And then Operation centers on underground here, and our tent was right out here. And the guy comes running up. Hey, you got a call from a helicopter pilot looking for you, huh? Yeah, three Mike Shark. That's S3 Mike for en enlisted, and Shark. I'm the next guy to go home. So get the radio operators here. He said he's got ten ten cases of beer with a red label from St. Louis. What, what can I, do you, you want to buy it? So the first sergeant sitting here, bring it on. I said, I don't have that kind of money. Ten cases, $2.70 a case at the time. So that's big bucks over there. So I said, what are we going to do with the other beer? Don't worry about it. So here comes the helicopter in with ten cases of Budweiser. So I dragged that in, loaded up on a Jeep. And first sergeant says, Get the Jeep tonight and we'll go sell it to the combat trackers you're coming in tonight. <laughs> so we sold it to the combat trackers and they were happy as hell to get beer because they, they would have got their two beers that night so we made their life their joy that time. But there were some things that you know you could fit together to have a little bit of excitement or fun but then that whole night we spent you know like they said don't go to sleep tonight you got to just keep walking around and do something so climbed up in the uh, control tower, you know, which was four things, it was about two stories tall, watching helicopters go and come from elevation, elevation like that. That was how I spent my last, last day in camp, but then you go south from there, went back to on K and then over to Cameron Bay to come home. But I wish, I wish we would have had the ability to take more pictures, you know, because now you look at my pictures and you, there's so much missing. And there's where you know now you take six pictures of the same thing with your phone or something, you know, where that your 24 year olds 
24 pictures on that roll, and boy, you, you had to be, you know, oh man, I don't want to run out of film. And my first, when I got the camera, which we had no place to get it, my cousin Joe was in uh, Cameron Bay, and he had he buy me a camera, and then he sent it up to me by the U.S. mail, and it, it got there. So I got my camera and loaded the first roll of film, and I didn't load the film properly. And, and that was a, a real good batch, that first batch I thought would have really been cool because the helicopter came in with a, a cache of, of enemy weapons that, that they had found and they were just loading these AK-44s which the old bolt actions and AK-47s, you know, the thing that all the terrorists use now, just throwing them on the ground and they were five dollars a copy for the, for the 44s because you could bring those home at the time. Five dollars, but you know, most of the stocks had shrapnel in them someplace because they where they came out of a blown up place where they found them. But by the end of the day, they were twenty-five dollars for those same rifles that were five dollars. I didn't, but I took pictures of all this, but that little film didn't go through. Mm. <laughs> didn't even load in the camera. Ah, dummy. And did I hear you correctly that your last night there, you were told not to sleep? Well, that was just a tradition. Why, it, why is that tradition? I don't know. It just was something that everybody did. And if it was one of your close buddies, you, you stayed up with them that night. You know, it's just silliness. But and it, it, one thing, I you know, I'm I'm a very gen, gentle man. But one, one of my guys, I think he was a, a radio operator, pretty close. And we spent every day with, you know, with this one guy. He was a big, tall guy, and he was when he was sharp and ready to go home. He was all anxious to go home and all happy to go home. And he was kind of rubbing it in your face, you know, I'm sharp, and it, everybody did that. You know, said I'm short? Sharp, you know, your sharp timer. Okay. And everybody had a sharp timer calendar. I still got mine, you know, you got the days till you go home, you know. And I just, I don't know what made me do it. I just jumped up and tackled them. We were rolling around and fought. We were the best of friends. You know, I said, what am I doing? You know, I just, but you just want to get out of it so damn bad. I don't want to beat her. So afterwards, we, we made up. But it was like, what did I do that? But you do silly stuff. Do silly stuff. But that, that's one of the things where, like, you know, your last day, you get two or three of your buddies, hey, you staying up tonight? Yeah, we'll, we'll go. We'll go walking someplace. And we, we had, a, and they brought, oh man, I even had, one of my pilots came in with orange sherbet. He came in from, from California someplace. They had orange sherbet and some pretty good steaks. I, I had a good going home party. And most people did. They, we, you find a way to find something good for everybody, you know, when it's their time to go. Because mm -hmm. they made it through. It's funny that. When they look back at that and think of some of those things, you think, geez, pizza. How do we do that? Have you heard the phrase, war is hell? Yeah, yeah. Do you agree with that phrase? I, I, oh, oh yes, I, I think so. How so? Well, you, you just, it, it, it's hard to say, and I mean, I was never had a rifleman point a gun at me. You know, so I was very lucky. We had bullets whizzing by, you know, the, the compound, you know, during the day or on guard duty. But you, you didn't do that. But when a rocket or a mortar comes in, it, it, it don't know where it's going. And it's going to hit something. And it makes a lot of noise. And, you know, it ain't like in the movies where the thing blows up here and the guy runs and, and jumps away from it. No, everything around that is gone. I mean, it, it's dead or hurt pretty bad. And... You, you get this instinct, it, it's, all, it's, it's, it's built into you when you hear it, it a rocket sounds like a, a big paper bag ripping open. It don't go boom, it goes, it's a cracking sound. And, and when, when those come in at, at close proximity, you're, you're running and you're looking for a place to hide really quick. And if you're underground already, you're just hoping that it's not going to hit right there. One time we had the uh, our mess tent, which we were getting not not A rations, we were getting B rations, which which meant it was something that the cooks would 
open up a big can of something and, and put something on a tray for you. You know, it was not actual fresh food or anything like that, but it was better than the little sea rations, which we had most of the time. And this was at lunchtime, and it's in a big open field. There's a generator here in the mess tent there, and you know, rocket hit on the other side of the generator. So where do we go? So we followed these cooks into their hooch, and the last one in knocked the, the blast wall over, you know, because you always bake away so the rocket can't crawl in with you, you know. So the last guy in nudged this roll of sandbags and it fell in. So we're looking out over his field and the thing hit on the other side of the mess tent, the other one hit by the generator. But we're going, so we're all moving back, far back in these guys, and that's their house where they lived. There was two cots in there, so we're crawling to the back of this thing. And I, you know, after they stopped firing, I made a joke. I said, man, if my mom knew what was going on over here, she would have never let me come. <laughs> and these guys, hey, yeah. and, like, yeah. and you could see, you could imagine the bad words that came out then. It was like, hey, you just the, shut up, baby. Mm -hmm. If my mom knew about this, he wouldn't let me come. But no, it, it was frightening. And it, it was that thing that was on your mind all the time. It was just there. You know, you knew that, that they, and it was, you know, what are we, 22, I mean, it, the rockets were big, and they, supposedly they just take these, take two pieces of tree, and they put the, just kind of, well, okay, hey, it'll hit something down there, and that's the way they shoot them at you. You know, they had no rocket launchers or anything like that. But they actually came out, if you ever see these, these Soviets or these Chicom rocket launchers where there's like 20 or so barrels in this in the back of the truck where it lifts up, that's the rockets that they were shooting at us, the same things that they use in, in that machine. So they, they were heavy duty rockets. And then the martyrs, you can't hear a martyr coming, but you can hear a rocket coming because it's still propelled as it's, as it's hitting the ground. But it, you ain't gonna die. You ain't gonna jump out of its way. But that was my my fun part, just making sure you always had a place to hide. Did you ever see anybody get uh, hurt or killed? Yeah, seeing those those three guys in that tent. I didn't see them when they got killed, but I seen the the results of that minutes after it happened, and I seen the injured people several times. And. Um is there anything from your experience from Vietnam that impacts you when you returned home? Uh, I didn't think so, but when when my wife and the other neighbor ladies, because on our street there was two other Vietnam veterans, and we always said, "Oh, there's nothing wrong with us. We're we're all straight. We didn't. It didn't affect us, but it, it did. I mean, it was we lose lose our tempers fast and, and do." stupid stuff and uh, I remember one time my, my my daughter was what five years old or something and she had I drained the hose you know follow the ears so it don't freeze I drained the hose and a couple minutes later I still got a bucket of water from washing the car but I already cleaned drained the hose out and she turned the hose back on so I, so I threw the bucket at her and it, it went through the star door and broke the window on the, on the star door and it's just Little things like that, you don't think that, you know, the, the instantaneous just do something stupid, but that was my thing that I could recall that I know I did s silly stuff. But there's, there's guys that are a whole, that are affected a whole lot more. I got two friends of mine and one guy's, he's really suffering now, he's got a, a glass eye, he got shot in the right in his nose and took out his sinuses. And then my neighbor well, at, at the old house, he had shot in the wrist, came out here, went in here, came out his back, and he had four stitches. One, two, three, four. They feel dressed him. They didn't, they didn't think he was going to make it. And that's, but the story in Vietnam that if you were shot or injured in Vietnam, you had a better chance of surviving than if you were injured on a 
about an auto accident in the United States someplace out, you know, in the field. Because there was helicopters to get you evacuated instantly. Medical care was there. Did you have any type of, like, nightmares when you returned home? Uh, no, I, I really, I, I kind of get, uh, you know, like, fireworks. The fireworks that are close that you can hear, that, that don't. It, it's, you know what it is. But the stuff, the stuff that's far away, the, the far rumbles, the, 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 I don't know, the very subtle booms that are far off. Because that was going on, that was 24-7 in Vietnam. And it was always outgoing artillery, which you knew was right here. But the, the stuff that was on the, on the horizon, the, the, the distant things blowing up, really, it, it, it's a thing with me. I, it, I just I get the shivers. Because you knew that when that was happening, somebody was getting hit. There was a, a, a base getting, and if it was concentrated a whole lot, you knew that somebody was really getting hit real bad. And, you know, you saw, oh, geez, what's, what's going on there? And then the uh, good old Stars and Stripes, like when those three guys that, that, that I seen that were killed, the, a day or two later, they, they give a recount of the, the rocket attack on Camp Evans. And, uh, yeah. U.S. casualties were, were light. One liner, you say, yep, tell that to your family. That was their response, light? It, it was a light, light, light casualties at Camp Evans that night. Well, I know three were done, two were done. But that starts and strikes, I mean, they, they have to, you know, I mean, it's, it's our propaganda, and that's good. I mean, they don't want to tell you how many guys every day that get shot or wounded or killed. They can't do that. I understand that fully. Is there anything from your experience that still affects you today? Uh, not, not really. I, I don't think. I mean, the, today is, is kind of a, a. It's kind of sad to equate that to what's going on in Afghanistan, but I, I realize that that same thing, the exact same thing, happened in Vietnam, and and I don't really. I, I understand. There has to be an end to something at some time, but the, the way I look at it, and I'm a 53-year member of the American Legion and a, about a 20-year member of the Vietnam Veterans of America, who was the one guy that didn't have to get killed? That, that's, that's my way of looking at it, because I, I know what the soldiers went through, because I you know, and I would have hated to be the last guy that got killed in Vietnam, or the last guy that got gets killed in Afghanistan for for some reason that you, you're going to give it back to him anyway. You know, and that, you're, I don't think you're going to impose democracy on on those people. They, they just don't. They don't want it. That's not their. That's not the way they live. And and that's that's probably what affects me now. And uh, well, say 20 years ago when the Gulf War first started going and all of the talk on the television and everything was war and all this going on and it was bothering me back then and I, I used the VA once a year to get a, a physical and to keep myself in the, in the gym over there so I could use the gym which you can't use because of COVID right now but I, I told that to the, the doctor and she said well maybe you ought to see a psychiatrist you know, psychiatrist, and she said, right now, you can go to her right now, so I walk down the hall and see, see another, and, and she said, you know, give you a whole bunch of questions, she said, how much news do you watch? I said, well, I got it on all the time. She goes, no, try this. One time a day, a, a major news source, one time a day, not 24-7, don't have it on the radio, don't listen to all that stuff, just try it. Get, get your mind off of that war mentality and deployment and so many troops going and all of that. She said, it, it, try that. And it really did. It worked for me. It, I mean, I, I don't need to know what's going on every stinking hour of the day on, on the war front. Back then, it was, you know, 
right after 9-11, it was the war front. I mean, it, and now it, it got so that, you know, a lot, lot of our, the younger guys in our Legion post that's had two or three deployments over there, they, they tell you the same thing. It's, these people, they don't want to do that. When the Army gives up that easy over there, they don't, they're not going to fight for their own thing. But that's, that's probably what leave, leave a, lasting, a lasting legacy with me is just, I would hate to see one more, one more troop lose his life over there for, I don't want to say for nothing. I know that they helped, they helped them out and they, they did a good job and an amazing job. But what are you going to do when, I mean, now Vietnam's prospering. I mean, man, they got manufacturing going on. I mean, <laughs> they're building all kinds of stuff over there. That's, but we, I'm, I'm very active in the Legion. I'm, I'm the adjutant, and that really keeps my keeps me busy. Keeps you know the, the paperwork going back and forth, and paperwork and the membership. And well, I just had a meeting yesterday, and due to the minutes and all of that, and then it's uh, the people here in, in, the, in the neighborhood, in that Soulard neighborhood downtown. They're really supporting us amazingly. I mean, if we don't have the veterans to cover it. They actually get in line to be a guest bartender or a guest cook. I mean, the, the people of this neighborhood down there just, they, they want to help out. And it's, it's kind of neat. They're really great, great folks down there. When did you return to the States? In, uh, let's see, sub September of 68. And uh, how were you welcomed when you returned home? Uh, well, my family was there at the airport, but that was it. Did you run into any protesters? Not really, no. The, my, my biggest time that I had as far as protests go, I, I tried going to, to junior college and taking some, some courses. And uh, that was 50-some-odd well, years ago when the St. Louis Blues were just getting started and they were in the playoffs that year. And uh, the younger people, I was here, you know, I was what? Four years older than the rest of the people in the class, you know, evening classes. And what was their term? Oh, you, were you in Vietnam? Yeah. Okay. Well, well, let's declare a moratorium, and let's uh, we would we'll close this class out now. We we'll declare a moratorium. So I'll get up and walk out. The teacher goes, folds up his books and walks. Out. What the hell's going on? Well, that's kind of a war protest. It's a moratorium. What? <coughs> That was kind of weird, and they did that about two or three times, and that just struck me as being funny. But uh, they would leave you in the room, and they all left. Well, they, well, I got up and left too. I mean, I could, if I can go home too. But I don't know. What how, year was that? That was 60, 60, 69 probably. Okay. It's just kind of weird, you know. We don't, there was all kinds of war protests, but I never had any in-your-face type war protests, with, you know. But when we Came, came back from, well, anytime you travel, you, you traveled in Class A uniforms. I mean, it was, you know, you had to be with, with your, all your stripes and stuff on. I mean, you're Class A's. We're not a travel in dungarees or work clothes, you know, and baseball hats. It's kind of, it's a different, you know, well, the Army, low, I don't want to say lowered their standards, but they lowered their, their dress code as far as that. You know, there's no... You only see that that's parade uniforms, you know, or you know, big, big uh, change of command ceremonies. But well, it, it, army, they, we didn't have the, the facilities or the stuff that, that the the troops have now, which I'm very grateful for, because I think that was, that was to the point of, I mean, every, everything we did, we were on our own. I mean, it was you, you, you built a shower, you. Built a, a, a latrine, and that's what you got. You know, you, you're there. But I know that there, there was some American Legion post that, that had really had nothing to do with the Vietnam returners. They, they didn't. No, you guys lost the war. We don't need you guys. Where my uncle was in this Legion post, and it's back to that old Polish community of South St. Louis there. That's what the core was. So, 
man, they were happy to have us young guys in there. We could wash dishes and run up and down the steps. They were real happy to have us, you know, so. But uh, the, there was one, one of my uh, Vietnam veterans of America, we had a, a Gold Star mother speak to us, an older, older lady, and she, she got up there and talked. She was with the, the white dress and the, the Gold Star, and she said, I want to clear, clarify something. She said, this, this whole baloney, and she was a, a nicer word than that, bullshit, about the greatest generation. The greatest generation of World War II guys left you at the curb. They didn't stand up for the returning Vietnam veterans. They never did. She said, you guys are standing up for the Afghanistan and the Iraqi guys and all of the troops behind you. She says, so you guys are the greatest generation in my mind. She says, my son came back dead, and you guys are honoring what he did over there, and you guys are honoring the people that are serving there now. Wow, that's a pretty cool old lady. I mean, she was, she was pretty, pretty well-spoken. And she had her, that ain't the first time she gave that speech about the greatest generation. I said, oh, cool. What did you do after you got back home? Well, uh, I knew I was going to go back to work at the cooling tower place because that was a, the job was waiting for me, and they were happy to have me back. And, that, and that, that was one thing I didn't have to worry about. And I, I knew by law they, they were supposed to take me back. So, and they were more than happy because they were already, you know, sending me letters. When you, when can you get back? You know, because they had a full line of work going on. So, and it wasn't long. And. My wife, I was already dating her before I went in, and both of her brothers, or all three of her brothers, were in, in the service. And so I didn't lose any time with that, and then we got married a, a year later in 70, so we dated that year, you know. And, and that, that all, that was the easy part, so. But well, we had a boat, and still had my motorcycles and stuff like that. We always. Always got a chance to play around pretty good, so we had a good time. And you worked for the uh, cooling company the right. whole time? Right. And the, the, the Lily Hoffman Cooling Tires, there were three brothers that owned it, and they, they sold it out to an investment company, which was, you ought to know, we, we knew we were in trouble when the name of the company was Harvest Equities, and that's what they did. They harvested all of the equipment. The, the plant was in Plainview, Texas. And so when that got sold to them, we managed to stick it out for about another year and then they finally closed that. But the plant was still down there. So the people in, in Texas bought the plant, the physical plant and all the machinery, and they hired me as the draftsman detailer and a, another guy from St. Louis for sales. They said, you guys just stay in St. Louis. So we had farmed a little office here. And it was up, at one time I had like 13 draftsmen working, I was chief draftsman. So we had a large, large engineering department. But we went a whole lot smaller, you know, because they just didn't need that much work. You know, didn't, well, they, the crew we had down there in, in Texas couldn't have kept up with the amount of work we had when it was Lily Hoffman, because, but I mean, they're, they're still, it's, it's the second owner now, uh, uh, bought the plant and they're, they're really, they're, I worked for him for four or five years also. I mean, same same method here. So we finally, can you work from your house? I said, well, be glad to. So like the last four years, I, you know, I can do AutoCAD from, from a computer anywhere. So that worked really good. So you're still working? No, no, no. I, I'm about four years retired now. Okay. Yeah, I just, you know, it, it's time. I mean, it's that, man, I want to enjoy it. I know so many people, they, they have to work, and uh, I can figure out something to do. Mm -hmm. And I do. I, I, keep, I keep more than busy. Is there anything you would like to add that I did not ask you? No, I don't think so. You pretty well covered it. I got a ch chance to tell you some good old-fashioned old war stories, but... Mm -hmm. No, I, I enjoyed the interview. It, it kind of brings me back, and I was thinking back the last couple of days, what what stood out in my mind, so I, I kind of did a little preparation, so. 
Is there anything you would like to tell future generations? Any words of wisdom or advice? Uh, uh, you know, I think that the, the military now, there, there's so many opportunities to learn some, some, some real skills that, that can be used, especially in the, in the line of uh, electronics, you know, communications and, and, and uh, anything. I mean, when, when you see videos from, from shipboard, you know, the, the Navy, I mean, even the, 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 the female operators in, in, on a Navy ship, it's just, it, it's, it's tremendous. I mean, and, and they, you know, look at the size of these ships that are going, or even, you know, the, the aircraft that the Army flies in that. I mean, it's, it's amazing. But that's, that's, that's one thing that kind of irritated me a, a bit, that in, in Vietnam we had, like our helicopters had one, one Bell tech wrap, and all the other guys taking these humongous transmissions apart and putting new seals and, and rebuilding these things. Now, that's all contracted out. You know, and it, it, I think they're, they're letting the, the, the enlisted men or, or the, the people in the Army or, or the Air Force missing out on a lot of that maintenance. And that, that's highly technical stuff. I mean, it's, you're going to need people at the, to work on electronics and the running gear of a helicopter or whatever, and I wish that they would allow the, the the troops to get more of that work instead of turning it all over to a subcontractor. And that's that's where Afghanistan is right now. I mean, so much of that is all a private contractor, and we we had our uh, we had a different tech rep come up <clears> that was hired from Bell and he he was a an aircraft mechanic in Saigon at, at Tansanu which was a great big humongous thing. Never had a, a chance of getting a rocket in there or getting overrun down there. So he gets off the plane when he's getting out of the army and at the time Bell offered him, Bell Textron offered him a hundred thousand dollars a year to go back to Vietnam as a as a tech rep. So he came back and they sent him up to the first camp, which was a line shoot. <laughs> he was a little jittery. Mm. He wasn't, you know, he, he said, I didn't sign up for this. But it just shows you that, you know, back then uh, they were given that kind of payment to someone that knew how to repair a helicopter. And I would imagine what it is now. I mean, it's got to be a whole lot more than that. But no, the, the, the service, I, I, you know, my, my son didn't, didn't have to go and I was happy at that time, but I think in a lot of ways he might have missed out on something. Miss, missed out on the, maybe the, the, the discipline or just the, the do it for yourself type of thing, you know. You, you're out there and you've got to take care of yourself. And, you know, he, he's successful now, he's doing fine, you know, got a family and Gotta pick one boy up from swim practice tomorrow, but keep keep in touch with those guys. No, the military ain't that bad. Hi. Yeah. Well, Daniel, I want to thank you for taking time out to meet with me and to share your stories. And I want to thank you for everything that you did and sacrificed for your country. Yeah. All right. Oh, you're welcome. Man. Like I say, it's just. Everybody did it back then because I always said when they took my grade school, I, I got to the draft board, yeah, hey, I know that guy, I know that guy, I know this guy. They did. Went right through the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. All right, thank okay, you. Okay, thank you.